What is hex? What are hexagons? And what is the definition of financial freedom? For anyone curious, allow me to show you. Two years ago, I was in a horrible place in my life. I was homeless, I was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and I was divorcing my wife by then. I had no hope, no goals, and I was just living day to day. Then I found out about Richard, and he helped me so much with his self-help books and videos that it changed my life completely. I was so thankful to found somebody who could now help me and give me the motivation to be successful in life. I started learning about Hex and it made me financially free. And this was the point when Hex Line and I started a YouTube channel. We understood that we have an amazing financial product in front of us that will make us financially free. And now we have to build a community, we have to bring our friends and families along with us on this journey. For me, it takes on new meaning as time goes on. The first part of it was monetary success. The next part of it comes that you feel like you're part of a community, some different type of community that you know, is not looking for money but is already got their capital. You know, and they're doing things and they're making things happen. A lot of love going on. There's a lot of overlapping care. Hexkins helping Hexkins, you know? And everyone's got open arms, you know? Call it a scam. Nobody really cares. We can tell you the only one that ain't prepared. Oh, yes, I'm gonna be a millionaire. Five, 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 a couple trillion shares. Oh, no, I ain't getting wrecked again. Richard Hart. He got a set to win. We're a family. We are the best of friends. We ain't a cult, man. Just call us Hexagon. 77. 46, 77. Oh. You won 5,000 Hex. Your, your future is pretty much set. You don't have to work ever again in your life. I did the calculation for my friend, right? And I staked out 5,000 hex for my friend for 10 years. And I did the calculation, bro, you're a millionaire already. <laughs> okay. Long story short, hex is a cult. What is the definition of a cult? According to Merriam-Webster, a cult is defined as great devotion to a person, idea, object, movement, or work. Often connected to the concept of ritualized sacrifice, cults are typically built around some sort of charismatic figure and held together with strict religious control. In 1968, for example, created by David Berg, a group now known as the Family International was formed, where hippies and unchurched youth were taken in, sheltered, and provided for inside isolated communes. According to anyone inside the cult at the time, David Berg was simply the iconoclastic founder of a non-traditional Christian movement. However, as years went by, escaped members and others familiar who were able to break free began to reveal that the Family International, also previously known as the Children of God, was a viper's nest of sexual or financial abuse, exploitation, and trauma. Focusing on the concept of recruitment, David Berg instructed, or rather inspired, his followers to share this dogma around the world with over 260 million people across 100 different nations. Boasting membership in the tens of thousands, the Children of God remains, to this very day, an example of cult allegiance and zealous devotion centered on a charismatic leader. Now, what does this have to do with Hex, you may ask? Well, let's find out. Hex is a crypto token, but not just a crypto token, a mechanism of financial freedom. Hex token is designed from the ground up to create wealth, but what if I told you that all it does, all it has ever done, and all it will ever do, forever into the future, is destroy? 
That kind of statement will inevitably cause backlash. Those who are stuck in the maze of cult ideology are not typically capable of rational thought. Worse yet, for those currently trapped inside the world of Hex, followers aren't just ensnared by dogmatic rhetoric, they are actually protecting their own investments. However, to explain this, we need to look at what Hex is, where it came from, and who is the leader responsible. This is Richard Hart. To be clear, Richard Hart is an alias. His actual name is Richard J. Schuller, but we'll address that later in the video. Richard is a quintessential charismatic leader. Inspiring his fans around the world, he has produced a token called Hex, which is advertised as a mechanism where they will become financially free. But what if all of it was a lie? Hex.com is an interesting place. Advertising a near 40%, 38% to be exact, annual return on staked tokens, a number higher than what is possible anywhere else in the entire crypto or traditional finance ecosystem when staked for an average of seven years, Hex is viewed by its community as a vehicle to uncapped personal wealth. I won't focus too heavily on technical aspects of the smart contract or devolve into frivolous details, but the gist of it is that Hex allows people to buy, stake, and earn interest by holding the token. Staking is a critical thing to understand here because staking is a mechanism by which users will lock their tokens behind a certain time limit. Upon entering the Hex ecosystem, you are highly incentivized, even pushed is the word I would use, into the world of staking because the more you stake and the longer you agree to have it locked away, the more interest you will earn as a result. Hex as a token is highly inflationary. More of it is generated every single time that tokens are unstaked, and when the marketing, branding, and advertising for Hex is built around the idea that you will someday be rich, it means that users have a hard-coded expectation of return. That's important because expectation of return is something that Richard Hart seems very keen to avoid. Self-help. Well, how, many, how many Hex have you sold personally? Uh, if you look publicly, it looks like zero, but I can't tell you because how we test, right? So you've never sold any Hex and taken any cash? You just have all the hex. Let's let's go over the rumors. Long? Let's go over the rumors. You used to be able to I'm transform. Not, I'm, not, I'm, just I'm, you I'm answering your question with more words. If you relax, I can't tell you about well, my finances because no Howie test. I can't tell you about my finances no, no. because expectation of value based on what I do. No, if you think the value is going to no, go up or down based on what I do, you. it's an expectation. I don't give people no, no, expectations. No, no. The Howie test has to do with work effort that you are expending on your part. If you simply right? tell people how That's many work. of your own. No, but yes, you just giving people assumptions did, about your future behavior is forward looking no, no, statement no, is asking, fucking not, bog standard. I'm not expectations. asking you what you're going to do in the future. I'm just saying, have you sold any of Listen. the hacks that you created and gotten cash for it or some other cryptocurrency? You know, it's just a yes or no question. You're not violating the no. Howie rule by, by telling me. Here are some of the many examples of hex marketing used to drive a further adoption and increase token value by onboarding fresh users. Subway screens, taxis, bus banners, trucks, magazines, even NASCAR sponsorships, and direct mail marketing postcards sent out all across the country from California to Florida. All of this specifically designed to broaden the public awareness of Hex and fuel increased demand. For some, that may seem innocent or uninteresting. They see these types of ads every single day, so why does it matter? But when building a foundation, the knowledge that Hex as a community has spent an incredibly large amount of money on acquiring fresh users is very important. Let's focus once again on the idea of expected return. Richard Hart, with extreme precision, I might add, plays a series of semantic games whenever he discusses Hex, the community, or potential returns. Similar to his unwillingness to engage in forward-looking statements, or discuss expected returns, or even just say whether or not he has sold any Hex tokens ever, we can see an equally obvious effort to redefine existing tax law. I have another question. Why did you choose to let, if you think Bitcoin sucks so much, why are mm -hmm. you letting people collect hex mm -hmm. by snapshotting their mm -hmm. Bitcoin private keys as uh, opposed to their co Ethereum keys? Colloquially I, called an airdrop. The reason that I don't like the airdrop term, yep. airdrop means someone else gave you something. Mm -hmm. I can't possibly give you anything. Only you can give yourself something by having these private keys. I can't give it to you. And when you end your, when you when you stake your coins and burn the coins, I can't stop you from doing it. And when you no, make a reward, I can't yep. I can't. There's nothing I can do to affect it. I have no fucking effect or control over it whatsoever. There's the, nothing the I can is, do. I'm just the complaint is going to call it an airdrop. So well, just, the reason I don't want to call it an right airdrop now. is because the United States, you're fucking taxed on your airdrops, aren't you? Right? No. And you're taxed on your forks, aren't you? And wouldn't it be cool if this wasn't an airdrop and a fork, right? And then in your jurisdiction, you might have preferential mm -hmm. tax treatment. Yeah, they're going to call it an airdrop. Well, and just adding I can only one do the best two, I can do, man. 
I, I, know, I can, I can, look, you, I can you try to fucking make try. a better thing and then you they can try and make it worse. You can't semantically by adding one little function or claim it's one thing and not another, uh, rewrite the laws that, that people is, have tried to do this for not true. Thousands of years right. have been trying to get away with modifying or getting around you the laws. Making and, and you think that analogy. you're, you you think that you're somehow the, the most creative guy in the world because you're I'm not, not. going to call it an airdrop because you say, That's Oh, well you have to plug an address in and you actually have to push work. So it's not an airdrop. Funnily enough, in every single publication article and reference out there, the initial free claim process has been universally recognized as an airdrop. Richard Hart is trying to game the system. It's not an airdrop, therefore it might have favorable tax implications. It's not an investment because no one has an expectation of return, even though everyone has an expectation of return. And subsequent airdrops aren't ICOs, initial coin offerings, because you don't buy it, you sacrifice for it. He continues to play these games in a deliberate effort to avoid regulation day in and day out. Expanding on this, we need to talk about what sacrificing actually is, because sacrificing is the life's blood of Richard Hart's empire. Traditional ICO sales are relatively straightforward. Buy the token, hope that the token increases in price, and later, sell the token. This kind of offering is certainly prone to abuse, with early investors often dumping their seed tokens or holdings on future investors after high initial gains, but sacrificing is a leak of its own. Hex was not launched with traditional mechanisms. Rather than only allowing people to purchase the token directly, which also was possible, thereby expecting to get rich, Hex was also given to everyone so long as they established proof of ownership in Bitcoin. In conjunction with this, Hex often broadcasts their number of wallets holding the token as a metric to be proud of. Big user base, high interest, strong project, or at least something like that, I think, is the thought process. It says right on their homepage, 515,000 wallets hold Hex. However, it turns out that over 170,000 of these addresses were given minuscule amounts of hex in order to drastically inflate the supposed user base, which even now is over one third of the entire community. But at launch, it was barely 200,000 wallets, according to the oldest archive I could find, which means that initially something like 85% of their token holders in entirety were fake. To put this in context, these wallets were given either 100 or 101 hex tokens, which means that the value they held wasn't even enough to cover the fees required to sell that many of the tokens. Most people probably didn't even know it was in their wallet in the first place. Funnily enough, I ran into this a long time ago in a completely different project. So yeah, a lot of threads tying back together. At the all-time peak price of hex, these 170,000 wallets would have each roughly had $40. The price has since come crashing back down to earth. And right now, as of the making of this video, that's nearly 200,000 people that have less than $3 in the project. And yet the website advertises a community that numbers over half a million. This is where Richard Hart will hide behind his semantics on whether or not this entire process was an airdrop. But what came after was infinitely more interesting. Hex by itself is just one part of a three-headed monster. Hex is the base token, Pulse Chain is the second offering, and Pulse X is the third iteration. In order to engage with Pulse Chain or Pulse X for those in the Hex community, you need to sacrifice. Rather than purchasing tokens or being awarded tokens based on prior holdings, like the first time with the initial Hex token, investors needed to sacrifice their money and expect nothing in return by sending it to an unknown address. What's more, Richard Hart has dodged answering the question on every single occasion where it's come up, whether or not he owns these addresses, whether or not he owns the founder's address as well, originally responsible for the creation of Hex, which is in fact his smart contract, so how could he not own it, and whether or not he is in control of almost the entire supply. Uh, this one came in from uh, a user on Twitter. Ask Richard who owns the Hex origin account. Well, you're not supposed to know. It's not publicly known. Worked out is good for Bitcoin. Who's Satoshi? Price went up 690 million percent. Is it is it you, Richard? Nobody knows. Not publicly known. Way. Who controls these? Nobody knows. Just like Satoshi. Who's Satoshi? Nobody knows. Did he ever so, dump the price? So, nope. But but somebody would have instructed the origin wallet to send to these daughter wallets. So How do you know it's even a human? Maybe it's a DAO with voting. Maybe it's a machine. Maybe it's a foundation. Maybe it's an African priest. Who knows? Here's the problem. Sacrificing is intended to circumvent regulation. Hex and further ventures like Pulse Chain and Pulse X are purpose-built to avoid existing legal structures, but the process itself, where money is sacrificed, had a leaderboard. 
When sacrificing, with a supposed lack of expected return, even though everyone expected a return here, there was a volume bonus multiplier where the more you sacrificed, the more you got back. This completely shatters the idea that users were not expecting anything back, because every single one of them got something in return, with a predefined rule set dictating how much, while being financially incentivized to sacrifice more and more and more. Even further, Richard Hart himself might have been the largest participant in these sacrifices, while refusing to ever acknowledge whether or not he owns the wallets. Still, why does it matter? It matters because Hex does not have underlying economic activity to generate value. The entire purpose of the smart contract is to mint inflationary tokens and distribute them to users who have locked theirs away. The longer you agree to lock your money, the more you get back. However, for Hex tokens to maintain value under the immutable pressure of constant inflationary minting, there needs to be fresh capital entering the system. In fact, in order for Hex to maintain its relative value right now, there will need to be hundreds of millions of dollars injected every single year, like clockwork, otherwise the token will crash. This is important because a huge percentage of people who have been absorbed by the cult are currently sitting on their hands with locked tokens. Now, that could be fine, temporarily or in the short term, because as long as the number of people injecting fresh capital surpasses the number of people trying to cash out, the price goes up. Basic logic. But as soon as the number of people coming out of lockup surpasses the number of people buying in, well, this happens. The cold hard truth here is that without the flashy marketing campaigns, the constant onboarding of fresh users who don't know any better, and the restrictive lockup timeframes to keep the public from cashing out, the price of Hex would crater to zero and never come back. Richard Hart has exerted great effort to avoid the technical classification of a Ponzi scheme. However, if you look at the reality of what Hex is and how it functions, you'll see that an asset was given to users through an obfuscated airdrop, who then unilaterally expected to get rich. Many of those users were convinced to lock up their funds for a set reward, which will temporarily stave off the inevitable collapse in price, but eventually inflow of new users to absorb inflation and unlocked selling will fall below a certain threshold, and the entire system will implode. According to community analysis, nearly all of the top 500 wallets that hold Hex right now are directly associated with Richard Hart himself. And while I cannot make a claim with absolute certainty on this, backtracking the origin wallets and the original funding addresses lends a great deal of confidence to the notion that Richard Hart is in full control of over three quarters of the entire Hex supply. This is a very strange thing, because Richard Hart has gone on record with public animosity towards Bitcoin on the basis that an unknown party controls a great deal of supply. Meanwhile, he refuses in all circumstances to acknowledge who owns the origin address of Hex, the sacrifice addresses for Pulse Chain and Pulse X, which contain hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars each, while a strong possibility remains that he owns nearly nine tenths of all circulating Hex tokens. Oh, dude, not? let me give you, let me give you some more bullshit, okay? If Bitcoin were fully adopted, do you think it's okay that an unknown party owns ten percent of the coins? Do you think it's okay that Satoshi owns ten percent of the global? currency supply because you don't know who's in control of the keys, right? So maybe Kim Jong-il becomes control of the keys. Now what? Right? So you can't have a fully adopted currency where 10% of it's owned by someone that you don't know who the fuck they are. That don't work. Okay. All of this raises questions to be sure, but how is it that I can label this community a cult? Well, for starters, how about this? I get people to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop gambling, stop trading, uh, drink more water, be healthier human beings. I've published multiple self-help books for free that you can go download at t.me forward slash SciVive. I have received thousands of emails from people whose lives I have saved. I've also raised $27 million dollaronis for medical research to save your life. So as far as people in cryptocurrencies go, I'm basically like a god, basically like a god, basically like a god. Hex is led by an enigmatic, deliberately secretive and charismatic leader. That leader also very likely owns the vast majority of all tokens. This leader has referred to himself as a god on more than one occasion and distributes funds to his followers by way of sacrifice. While doing so, he uses strong religious themes, evangelical rhetoric, and his followers travel the country in groups attempting to convert new users. One example of this is called the 5555 tour, which indicates the maximum number of days that Hex can be locked in the system, which saw community members traveling thousands of miles to hold seminars, rewarding prospective new cult members with lottery opportunities, and reeling them in with promises of massive returns. This effort was designed to pump the price of Hex to $7, but faced with unrelenting downward pressure as a result of inflation and community selling, the price never even crossed 50 cents. 
everyone who came on board, everyone who invested during the most prominent marketing cycle that the token has ever seen, everyone who succumbed to the pressure of the cult is now down massively and effectively stuck, forced to push the cult's message to anyone who will listen, desperately hoping to find an exit. In preparation for this video, I spoke with a number of different sources, one of which was actually present during this national tour, and another who has been involved with Hex since the very beginning. I was also allowed to verify this with private documents and wallet addresses, giving me a high degree of confidence that these whistleblowers are a reputable source of information. According to some of the earliest, most vocal supporters of Hex as a token, who self-identify as having escaped the cult, Richard Hart has led them into a system where it is extremely difficult to break free. Early adopters are forced to wait until there is enough liquidity before they can even turn a profit, which means they are faced with only two options. Either help perpetuate the growth of the cult, and thereby allow themselves an exit strategy, maybe, which may in fact be highly profitable as well, or go against the community and likely lose everything. One potential source, who was most likely very familiar with the inner workings of Hex, flat out refused to speak to me, citing that they had a substantial sacrifice bag that they did not want to see damaged as a result of exposing the cult's inner workings. It was, quote, the only reason he stayed in the community, because the reality behind Hex is extremely troubling. Early adopting whales are the very first people to unlock their tokens, generally speaking. What do they do? Well, with more circulating theoretical value of Hex than could ever possibly be redeemed for actual cash, they are forced to perpetuate the revolving door of user adoption and take turns selling into these new customers as they create liquidity. The new customers? They are typically convinced to lock their investment for a set period of time, waiting helplessly as the liquidity dries up completely and the value of their investment craters as a result. All the while, more and more tokens are entering circulation, building up a massive glut in the market that realistically can never be redeemed. When will this overextension unwind? I'm not sure, but when it does, well, that's when people lose everything. Still, all of this so far pertains to Hex directly and the systems behind it, but there is one more thing integral to the prosperity of any cult following, and that is its leader. Richard Hart, also known as Richard Schuller, has a lengthy history before his creation of Hex, some of which is cause for concern. Richard Hart's own website refers to him as a force for good in this world, yet his fortune, millions of dollars from a very young age, was built on an empire of spam. Quote, my name is Richard Schuller. I'm a 23-year-old multimillionaire, and I'm inviting you to learn how to spam millions of people per day like I do. I used to work for usaprescriptions.com, and now I operate my own online pharmacy business, which is Hacker, IRS, and Anti-Spammer Untouchable, and is the single largest spam email marketing company in the world today. End quote. What's more, according to some very early conversations that were actually leaked between Richard Hart and a man named Jonathan Sterling before the Hex token even launched, I believe, Richard Hart was stating that he would soon be truthful about his identity, and yet, years later, after multiple sacrificial funding rounds that very much seemed to connect back to him personally, that still isn't the case. Even deeper, there appear to be multiple passports of his under false names from multiple separate countries. Out of respect, I won't share these publicly, but they are allegedly part of a broader conspiracy in which contract murder took place, leading to Richard Hart eventually fleeing the country of Panama with an urgent cry for help to the Panama American Citizen Services. Once again, even further, established by a lawsuit in 2002, Richard Hart, or rather his actual identity, Richard Schuller, was one of the very first people in the world to be successfully sued for online spam, indicating that he may be extremely familiar with emerging unregulated industries or technologies, and may have, historically speaking, used that lack of regulation to take advantage of people with unethical and predatory business tactics. Richard Hart previously sold anti-aging cures, among other ventures, landing himself the title of Spam King, and after finding himself on what seems to be the receiving end of a robbery in Panama, perhaps as a result of the criminal ring he may or may not have been associated with, where accusations of alleged activity include extortion, blackmail, and robbery, he seems to have fled the country and moved on to crypto. The Cult of Hex is a complicated creature, created by a man who has referred to himself on more than one occasion as God, designed to dodge the legal structure of securities and taxation policy, formed around the concept of sacrifice rather than investment, and reinforcing participation by locking members inside as long as humanly possible, Hex is a brilliantly constructed financial cult, with members who will stop at nothing to help it succeed. This video could be four hours long. While researching and discussing with sources, I was made aware of an instance that strongly points towards $26 million being siphoned out of a sacrificial address and put directly back into manipulating the market price of Hex itself. I learned about a prior token created by Richard Hart called CFD, which utterly failed, with much of the evidence deleted or pulled down. I was given countless clips where the development structure of the project changed, from an Ethereum fork to a Binance fork, or a nearly insurmountable number of examples where the project has been delayed. 
week after week, month after month, soon perhaps year after year, because it seems that the project, or products rather, don't actually exist. But for the sake of time, I'll wrap it up with this. Hex influencers, many of the largest whales responsible for the most aggressive marketing maneuvers, contributing to the rise of the token price during the initial pump, such as the 5555 tour, where they travel the country looking for new investors, have been subpoenaed by the SEC. Regulators are starting to take notice, and just because a project has avoided the technical wording of a Ponzi scheme right now with new technology, or a multi-level marketing scam, doesn't mean that it's functionally different. For the people stuck inside, it's a prison, and I feel for you. But pushing this project on others in a desperate attempt to dig yourself out of such a hole is not an ethical thing to do. Eventually, the number of people joining the cult will be smaller than the number of people trying to leave. That seems to be the case already. And when that balance is too far disrupted, it all comes crashing down. For right now, Hex remains, some sort of twisted financial cult hybrid that continues to find fresh victims each and every day. His community displays great devotion, not only to Richard Hart, a charismatic quasi-religious authority figure, but also to the idea of financial freedom. From every direction, every angle, and every perspective, I believe that Hex fulfills all existing criteria as an actual, legitimate cult of worship, only instead of divine power, they worship at the altar of Richard Hart and crypto. However, when that finally changes, and change it will, the fallout will be extreme. That's it. If you want to support, please check out the links down below, Patreon and Locals for a monthly subscription, merch, social media, etc., etc. But I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching and have a nice night. Mm, I'm basically like a god. <laughs>